Welcome, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for our Game of Thrones finale. I had no idea we would cover this much on this miniseries, but once I realized we had horses and stunt professionals with swords and action VFX in our corner, I remembered how much I love playing make-believe with friends. So thanks for coming along on the journey and for being so awesome. Yes, I'm talking to you. So today, we're covering these two shots inspired by a few nifty moments from the show. And they're obviously a bit complex, but if you're a student of the Cheap Tricks University, many of these core principles we're about to cover are already in your arsenal. We're keying some footage, modifying some of it, creating some backgrounds from stock materials, downloading some animated dragons and zombies, and rendering them with Element, then mushing them all together in Super Comp. And heck, we've pretty much done all that before, so refer to the handy table of contents below if you ever want to jump to a specific point. Otherwise, let's start with this shot. This original shot aired around the same time our team was working on making graphics for the Red Giant VFX suite. And this shot was just so on the nose, I couldn't resist picking it. Only problem was, we'd already filmed all of our assets weeks ago. Though this one piece of footage might kinda work, only problem is, she's kind of dressed in Sin City chic from these awesome shots that Leo Hageman made. So how do we make her look more like a mother of dragons? She needs a wardrobe makeover. And if you tuned in for our dead horse episode, you know that Kingpin Tracker can be utilized for pinning unconventional shapes. And now it's pretty obvious where I'm going with this. I was able to bring in this more on-genre bodice and use Kingpin to pin this dress to the original plate. And since the shape I'm tracking is kind of amorphous, not really a square, there were times that I got distorted results, but redefining a different rectangle and trying again usually solved this problem. From a decent track, I could use these custom transforms within Kingpin to make the bodice fit. Next, our actor is holding this revolver, which, yes, I know is part of Danny's signature look, but uh, she didn't have her revolver in this particular shot. So, I quickly hand key a mask to chop off her hand. Spoiler alert. So next, Darkman style, I take a flipped copy of her other hand and run Kingpin Tracker to place it right where the old hand used to be. And voila! Lastly, I needed a cape. And to be honest, I actually just grabbed the cheapest stock footage I could find of a 3D flag because I was in a hurry. But what I should have done is remembered Cheap Tricks number one, where we used mirror to create cloth like curtains. All you do is apply mirror to a solid, adjust the geometry to the rough shape you want, increase the number of vertices, and then go to fractal settings to add an expression to the offset Y, like time times 150, and then also one to the evolution, like time times 100. Now it waves around. But it doesn't look much like cloth until you turn down the frequency and reduce the frequency Y parameter, especially. And check that out. Uh, now under material, you can select a different color. And under shader, you can switch the blending mode to normal and get something marvelous like this. And just like in a Wrinkle in Time episode, I'll create another solid called ramp, to which I'll add a default gradient ramp. I'll hide it. And then back in Mirror, under Fractal, I'll set that ramp, with its effects and masks, as an amplitude layer. Now the cloth isn't waving around much at the top, but it is at the bottom. Next, I'll totally cheat and use a Bezier warp to make it a more capey kind of shape. And check this out. And in addition to this, this layer is truly 3D. I can move the camera around it. Also, I'm, I'm being modest with this shading. I could load in a material and then point to it in the material settings and get something like this. Or I could, you know, pre-comp that texture, add some roughened edges to the bottom and, and get something like this. So yeah, what, what I'm saying is that this cape could have looked a lot better if I had just stopped for five minutes. But what am I supposed to do about it, you know? Share that information for free in a tutorial? Yeah, it's my job? Thought we were just hanging out. I basically parent that cape to our lady and then mat in a shadow of her body so it looks a little bit better. And then check this out. Now obviously if you were starting from scratch, you should film your actor in the right costume. But we didn't know this shot existed when we started filming these ones and I really wanted to do it. And you know, they say that necessity is the uh, mother of 
dragons. Alright, let's get her into a scene. Uh, I found this one on iStock, and after buying it, I'm kind of positive it would have been just as effective to pan across a still image, but in any case, I'm going to give this scene an overhaul just like we did with our costume. I run the After Effects camera tracker, which gives me a very simple tripod solve. So I'll define a plane so I can use it to mask out this foreground area. I stretch out the background building kind of horizontally to fill more of frame. Then I use a luma key and some garbage mats to punch out that whole center area so I can add in a different background later. Then I'll change some of the stonework by placing in this stone dragon relief too, because Chinese inspired dragons are cool. I throw all these things together, slap on a bit of color correction, and add some RG shadow. And now it's time to just wing it. Uh, dragon wing it. And we've got just the thing. If we go to Sketchfab and type dragon, then check downloadable and animated, they actually have a handful that are free. Also up top here are a few for purchase, including the one that I'm going to use today, called Irval the Wyvern, or Irval the Wyvern, or something. In this preview window, it looks like she comes with a handful of animations, including a takeoff that looks kind of reminiscent of this one. Also a glide that ought to work out for a dragon attack shot. All for 50 bucks. And there are certainly more expensive and complicated 3D dragons available out there including ones that may even look more on point for the show, but, you know, since this one's already animated, it's worth it to me. So I'll download her and extract the files. She's an animated FBX, like we've worked with a billion times before. And we're gonna do the same kind of thing we did with the zombies. Now, I'm not a Cinema 4D expert at all, but I've learned to handle a few very specific things when it comes to these animated FBXs. So I'll relink the texture so I can see roughly what I'm working with. And this particular FBX file contains all the animations in one 5400 frame series, and I only need a short bit of it. So I go to Window, Timeline, the dope sheet. I scrub through the timeline until that takeoff action. In this case, it starts at 4773. I go to Function and say Trim Before. And then I'll scrub to the end of this particular action, around frame 4830 and say function, trim, after. Now I've got just this teeny little section of the dragon taking off. I can drag those keyframes all the way back kind of to zero on my timeline. Now this animation is meant to be played at a much faster speed, but my shot is in slow motion. So in that dope sheet, I'll select all those keyframes, and then it's super easy to just stretch the keyframes apart by clicking and dragging right here. I'll make the whole animation last closer to 200 frames instead of just 60. And a quick playback shows me that that speed is much more appropriate for this shot. Alright, now I'm going to get fancy. Now this dragon is looking up at the beginning of shot, which means that it'll probably be visible behind our actor. And we've really got to play the camera here. So in that dope sheet timeline, I'll twirl open all the keyframes until I find the spine and neck and head keys. By around frame 70 or so, the dragon could be looking up, so I'm going to delete all the keyframes for these body parts before that frame. Now if I go to frame 1, I can kind of repose my dragon, one joint at a time. In this case, pressing the record keyframe each time I've posed it correctly. Bending each neck joint just a little bit at a time gives me the cumulative effect of a nicely bowed head. And when I play back the animation, the wings unfurl right before the head pops up. Doing some similar tweaking to the wings on frame 1, I preserve some of that pre-animated flap, while also getting these nicely wrapped looking wings at the head of the shot. All so the reveal can be just as subtle as, as this shot. Or this one. But never as good as this one. I'll use Riptide Pro to export an OBJ sequence of this takeoff, and then I'll head to After Effects, where, like many times before, I'm creating a new solid, adding element, jumping in there, and importing my dragon sequence. I link her up to the materials provided with that original download, and then save that texture as a preset so I won't have to do it again later. I click OK and then jump back into my scene. In Elements Group 1, I'll create a new group null, which once positioned and scaled properly, and then combined with a color matcher filter and some fake motion blur, we get this gem. Now, obviously on loop, it's a teeny bit clunky, but 
But you know, initially impressive, but actually kind of clunky is like my whole brand. Don't take this away from me. Here, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna render these wings out as a PNG sequence that you guys can download and use because Red Giant gives you wings. Please read disclaimers. Okay, where was I? Well, to finish off this piece, I have two things I wanna do. I wanna use some of Action VFX's beautiful stock pieces of footage to tie this together. And I also want Super Comp to blend my layers together nicely. Now, we've got a unique little situation on our hands. For now, because of how 3D layers are rendered by After Effects, Super Comp needs 3D layers to be pre-comped. Effects like Element and the Trap Code plugins are fine, but if I were to bring in my stock footage and make it 3D, it won't look right in Super Comp. Now, if you recall, there was no depth from my camera track. It was a nodal tripod solve. So, what I'm gonna do is create a stand-in null. I'll call it background null. And then I'll add an expression to its position. Referencing this plane back here, I'm gonna use the famous two comp expression. So now, this 2D layer is moving wherever that 3D layer appears relative to camera. Now if I were to bring in, say, this dust element, I can parent it to the background null, and it'll translate roughly like if it were a 3D layer. Usually you use techniques like this for lens flares and stuff, but in this case it's a great way to get 3D informed layers interacting well in SuperComp. I'll place my stock elements to create a hazy atmosphere in the background here, some light dust particles in the air that kind of play like ashes or something, and also I want to use these dust waves to really enhance the background wing flaps of that dragon. Each one of these is parented to that background null, so as I play through, its position tracks with the camera move. Now remember that thoughtful experimenting with the timing and placement of each stock element, including time remapping, frame interpretation, is always a part of successfully integrating such elements. Once I'm about to this point, it's time to turn over all of these layers to Super Comp, where I can do some more photoreal blending of these layers together, adding things like haze or light wrap, diffusion, edge blending, and as I do, everything begins to just feel more and more married together. For example, here's it with, and here's without. Now, as is often in my practice, I'll add an adjustment layer above Super Comp, so I can add in some curves or color matching. I use Mojo to simplify the color palette, Universe Heat Wave and Chromatic Aberration to create kind of a thicker air and eerie kind of feeling and then Renoiser on top of all of that to bring me back a little bit of film grain to this really almost entirely synthetic shot. I mean, we, we made over this actor, we made over the background, added a CG dragon, enhanced it with stock elements, and if you ask me, it's not a bad way to go if you want to make something in the fantasy genre, but don't have very much to start with. I mean, remember that this actually started with this. Pretty nifty. All right, my friends, let's move on to the final shot. In many ways, it's the culmination of everything we've learned on this Cheap Tricks Game of Thrones miniseries, and I wanted it to be challenging, for better or worse. So when we were brainstorming, I proposed doing something like this, but, you know, betterer. Now, thanks to a very supportive team at Red Giant and also the hard work of Martis Fatek, I get this beautiful piece of footage, which I can bring in and stabilize and reposition a little bit to give me some more headroom at the end of shot. And now I can get started. And the camera's moving in this shot, unlike most of my other shots. So I'll draw a garbage mask around Marta at the beginning. And so if I throw this footage into another comp, I can run the camera tracker without it getting confused by her costume. Now, I get some results, but not good ones. So, you know what, I'm gonna delete this camera track and run a hack that I like for background green screen psychs. Now, back in my pre-comp, I'm gonna add Colorama to my footage layer. Then in the output cycle, I'll select the gray ramp and then pull this almost hard to see black down to the bottom of my output cycle. And now, if I increase the repetitions just a little bit, I see some distinct patterns appearing in my footage. This is basically turning that subtle color variation of the background, including those tracking markers, into something a little bit more distinct the camera tracker can readily identify. So let's give it a shot. And hey, it looks like I've got some more background points to work with now, which is perfect. 
Now I can create a plane that's kind of somewhere in the background. Maybe add a null locator here just to anchor myself. And also I'll synthesize a plane that's somewhere between these two lights that I can kind of hand move back and forth until it feels like it's the middle of my composition. These 2.5D guides will help me really build the scene around them. I can jump back into that pre-comp, disable my colorama effect, and use that garbage mask as an alpha mat for the original footage. Now, as can happen with the AE camera tracker, the positions are a little wackadoo. This midground, for example, is 63,000 pixels back, and the scale of my scene is astronomical from a pixel perspective. So just as I showed you in detail in my Aquaman episode, I'm about to do some 3D normalization of my camera tracking data. So I'll place this mid-ground guide solid right in the center of frame. I'll parent all of my 3D layers to it. And now I can reset its position to be 960 by 540 by zero, the center of this HD comp. Now I add a dummy HD solid that's 3D, but not parented to anything. Then I can adjust the scale of my mid-ground element until that dummy solid is mostly filling frame. So now I can delete that dummy solid, unparent everything. So now if I reveal the position of my far background, I see that it's like 6,600 pixels back instead of the previous 145,000 pixels back. Also, all the new elements I import will be centered in the foreground and at a reasonable scale to work with. Then I might as well run Primat Key on Marta. I'll auto-define the key, clean up the background, restore the foreground, check the core matte switch to get rid of little holes in her cape, things like that, and also throw on the green spill killer. So now we've got her element to work with. And full disclosure, future me knows that I'm gonna comp in Marta to my animated background in a whole separate step at the very end of this tutorial. And so her layer's gonna look pretty wrong the majority of the time. I know this, I know. So uh, I'll bring in this still image of this winterscape and I'll kind of flip it around and place it way back here around 6,000 pixels back. And since there's no other live action reference than Marta, I can sort of fudge where the horizon line is and just make sure it looks decent in playback. Now let's hop back over to Cinema 4D where we've got all those handy dragon animations. Just like with our dragon taking off, I found this little section where the dragon's doing a pretty pronounced wing flap through frame. I did initially try a glide, but it really didn't look like the dragon was animated at all. So I'm going with this, and just like in the last shot, I modified the animation a bit to have the dragon's head facing a little bit more down and her jaw open to spew some fire. Uh, then I exported this OBJ sequence so I could use it in Element just like before, applying the dragon texture preset we saved earlier. I'll also load in that same Winterscape background image as the environment map. I don't always recommend doing this, but I think it'll work out with this relatively monochromatic background. Next, just like before, we'll create a group null so we can give this dragon a flight path. I'll scale her so she would appear large in the foreground, but then I'll push her far into the background. And then just with a few simple position and orientation keyframes, I'll set her on this little curved path right down through frame. And the fewer keyframes, the better, in my opinion. To get the timing of the wing flaps to look best with this shot, I'll add some keyframes to the baked animation. Um, I'll make them 0% all the way until she enters frame and then switch it to 100% the next frame. And since her, her flying is actually a loop, uh, I could have probably just offset her as well. Some standard stuff for element, I'll enable the shadows, turn up the ambient occlusion, add a real smart motion blur and some color matcher, and I'll add a light that kind of approximates the sun, the way it's looking on these faraway mountains, and then some bluish gray ambient light from all this ice and snow, and lastly a warm underlighting right here, as I imagine there will be flames and explosions and stuff. Once I've got all that in place, I'll pre-render her just to save a bit of time later, and hey, you know, Dragonheart's got nothing on this. Actually, I love Dragonheart. I'm sorry, boo. But you know what that movie didn't have was zombie hordes. And you know what? I made one of those last episode. Let me dig that up. Little dead body humor for you. The good gravy who... 
leaves a comp open to that frame. Uh, anyway, you can watch part three to see the details of how this horde came together. Today I've got the relatively easy task of just repositioning the camera and adding a top spotlight to simulate that fiery death from the sky. And then I think I'll just pre-render this little bad boy. And now that I've got some pre-rendered zombies and a dragon flying through frame, look how easy it is to just drag and drop them right into this piece. Anything that needs to be somewhere in the background, I just slide back like five or 6,000 pixels until it looks about right. Now these zombies have all got to die as the, uh, I know, as the dragons fly through. And did somebody say shatter? Yep, just like in our last episode, I'm gonna literally keyframe them to shatter at the thought of fire for some reason. I'll pre-render that in the background, and in the meantime, I'll jump over to Action VFX to get some groceries. Fire groceries. Back in After Effects, I'll turn to that dragon null, and I'm gonna parent a new null to that. And if I use the gizmos to just offset it, I can create a locator that's right where the dragon's mouth is. Then in another comp, I'll combine some of those fire trails with a fireball that I got from Action VFX into this kind of pillar of fire thing. It looks all right. And uh, completely ignoring the laws of physics, I'm gonna take that comp and parent it to this mouth null, adding some rotation keyframes and masking until I get something like this. Now, while I was on Action VFX, I grabbed a couple of explosions, some exploding debris, water splashes, and some ground crumbles. And now it's time to do some VFX jazz. Just placing, scaling, and timing and improvising these stock elements together to give me something very explosive and fun. Now you could mess with elements like these all day long, and I'm trying to stay kind of minimal, but really, I just need all of these explosions and debris and shattering zombies to work closely enough together that when I super comp them, all of the glows and wraps will really make this pop. Now behind all this crazy destruction, I placed two copies of this amazing ground crack element. I'll tone it to match the colors of the icy background, and then behind that, I'll create a duplicate copy of my background that's a little bit darker, and I'll mat it to just be in these little cavities created. So it looks like a nice little, you know, ice cave-in situation. Now, since I forgot that background null trick that I did in the last shot, I've got all these 3D layers that I want to use in Super Comp. So for now, I've got to pre-comp all of these elements and kind of tidy up the comp at the same time. I'll even create one pre-comp that's actually all the fiery explosive elements from this comp, and then use VFX reflection to make them all reflecting here in the ice. And now that I have all of these distinct layers, I can bring them into Super Comp. Now I'm just gonna ignore the queen layer and just work at the background to begin with. With the two gas explosions, I'm using some heat blur, core matte, and optical glow. The heat blur distorts the image around the explosion. I can even kind of splay it out like this. The core matte is like a feathered mat that preserves the inner darker colors of this explosion, basically making it both an additive and normal layer at the same time and the optical glow is just a kiss of a beautiful bloom that envelops these wings, the debris, and just blends everything together. So here's that on and off. You can see what it's doing. I'm gonna do some version of that to all of my fire layers, and then also for all of the normal layers, I'm gonna add light wraps, diffusion, and haze that'll take in a lot of that bright information and the background information and blend them all together. And here's the final before and after. Now I'll create a new comp all together where I can bring in this whole super comp background layer and my foreground queen layer and see if I can get them to play nice. I'll apply a slight camera blur to the whole background piece, which I'm sure is kind of a nice crutch too. And then in my Marta pre-comp, I'm gonna use a classic technique to create a bit of an offset orange rim on her by creating an orange solid, setting it to track matte, and then using a blurred offset copy of the original footage to fake a rim. And I can key this to kind of add a flame lit side to her here. Next, I struggle for what feels like an hour trying to make this 
clean foreground lady look like she's part of this scene? It kind of looks like a, you know, like a souvenir postcard from Universal Studios or something, which is totally what I was going for, by the way. But then Marta, who forged her own sword, suggested that the zombie should be closer. And when someone with a sword makes a suggestion, you, you know, I decided to leave that background intact, just so there's a lot of levels of details in here. Then I jumped to my element zombie horde composition, where I copy over my 3D tracked camera, and then position the whole group to be more of an impending threat. Now this crowd's a little more monotonous up close, so I'm gonna do some misdirection by adding in a single giant character. So I jump over to Mixamo, grab their skeleton zombie, apply a slow walk forward, and then export his OBJ sequence from Cinema 4D, and I have him an element in less than five minutes. I'll add him to his own group, add a few keyframes to his group's null, and we've got ourselves a nice little creepy zombie giant marching alongside the horde. So I'm really not kidding when I say that this is a super fast and relatively easy way to add CG characters to your scene. So just like in our last episode with the skeleton shadow creature and our Aquaman shark face monster, I'm going to render a world position map, basically a depth map which you can set in elements output settings. This is just a nicely gradated version of the shot that will allow me to composite some flames with convincing depth later. I pre-render the beauty pass and the depth map and then throw them into my comp that had previously just had Marta and the, uh, the faraways. This new horde is easily added into super comp. Next I bring in a copy of that depth mat, hide it, and then on that zombie layer I can use the set mat effect to point to that layer and make sure that effects and masks are checked. Now, just like last episode, I can use some brightness and contrast sliders on the depth mat layer to interactively key out certain levels of depth with these zombies. I'll make the background ones disappear as that existing flame element starts to encroach, and then I'll add more fire. The cool part is that I can apply this same depth map to this foreground fire and really make it look like those flames are wrapping these nearby deadlings. And holy moly, that's why you should always listen to people with swords. And, and also, good golly, I feel done. I'm done with this series. I'm done with this series. We have mined Game of Thrones until there's nothing left. But what I hope you take away from the last four episodes are things like an understanding of how cool Super Comp is, and Kingpin Tracker's awesome abilities, and how Spot Clone can get you out of a jam. But even more ambitiously, you know, whatever tools you have at your disposal, realize that people work really hard to make them, and resources are becoming more accessible than ever, including things like, you know, free animated dragons and free green screen footage, for goodness sake. I mean, your imagination is really the only limit on what you could do with free resources like this. So do it. Now where's my soapbox? Game of Thrones brought together so many artists and craftspeople to create an entire realm. Be one of the people who talks more about that, and less about a cup of coffee that, you know, let's be honest, you didn't notice the first time around. Let's celebrate the fact that they practically created cities and lake beds to film in amazing real locations, and then infuse them with cutting edge visual effects that these guys should be really proud of. So deal with it if you thought some of the stuff was a little rushed and you didn't get the Happy Meal toy you wanted. Successful filmmakers have to be good at collaboration and inspiring large teams of people to work really hard to make something that we'll watch sitting in a chair. So if you think you can do better, prove it. Be constructive, be collaborative, inspire people with your ideas. After all, playing make-believe on the big or little screen is, is really why we're all here doing this in the first place, so let's play.